So, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, scientific uh, contribution of ICAST 11, uh, the contribution by Professor uh, Dirk Helbig while he's uh, installing his uh, other computer uh, to the system. I, I will introduce him a bit. So, Professor Helbig is chair of sociology, sociology in ETH Zurich, Zurich in particular uh, of modeling and simulation. His education is uh, physics and mathematics, but he was always interested also in other fields uh, of science. So his PhD thesis in physics at the University of Stuttgart was about uh, interactive social behavior, and his habilitation also in Stuttgart was about uh, traffic dynamics. So before he came to ETH, he was professor and management uh, director of uh, the Institute of Transport and Economics at uh, Dresden University in Germany. And uh, among many other activities, uh, Professor Helbig is currently chairman of ETH Zurich's Competence Center Coping with Crisis in Complex Socioeconomic Systems. So today, Professor Helbig will talk about an ambitious endeavor, future ITC, ICT flagship, creating socially interactive information technologies for a sustainable future. Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here to talk about this future ICT flagship that we are trying to construct at the moment. The European Commission has called for two major research initiatives and they want to spend 1 billion euros each on those projects over a time period of 10 years. Um, and we have been thinking about this question, what we, could we do with that money? How could we spend it best? And so what we came up with is this future ICT knowledge accelerator to explore and manage our connected world. And it involves more than 300 scientists from all over the world, including the academic powerhouses of Europe and also with connections to the US, to Japan, to China and other places. And uh, so basically the mission is to turn around this man on the moon vision that actually the European Union has been calling for to say, okay, we know so much about the universe and so little about how society works. We somehow lost control of events on our earth and that requires us to pay attention to what is going on over here. To recognize the need to act, we have to recognize that our world has changed. Globalization, but also technological change have created a strongly coupled world. We have now a global exchange of people, money, goods, information and ideas. But what does that mean? Well, on the other hand, we recognize a number of problems such as the world financial and economic crisis, global terrorism and international wars political instabilities, revolutions, global environmental change, extreme weather, organized crime, cyber crime, a quick spreading of emerging diseases, global disruptions of supply chains, migration and integration problems. So is the network structures that we have created also a structure that provides pathways for disaster spreading? It seems so, but we need to understand that in more detail. And so the question really is, what does it mean to live in a connected world? I mean, nobody would debate that, certainly. But for a long time, I have not really thought about the implications. Just assume we would have a strongly connected world as compared to a loosely connected world. What would be the implications? Well, first of all, that implies a faster dynamics, an increased frequency of extreme events, and further on, those extreme events could have any size. And we know that in strongly coupled system, a normal distribution would, norm, uh, would not be characteristic, actually, of the behavior of the system components. And instead, in many cases, we would find a power law, and that exactly implies that 
Extreme events would be much more frequent than expected according to a normal distribution. Well, st strong connections also means self-organization in the system. The eigendynamics takes over. There is also a strong correlation. So this dominates the system dynamics. Further on, the unwanted feedback cascade and side effects. The system behaves often in counterintuitive ways. And as a consequence of all this, predictability goes down, which also means possibilities of external control are limited, and actually most of those systems are also so complex in the sense that they're NP-complete that the system optimum cannot be found in real time, not even with some supercomputers. So all of this has increased, or would increase, vulnerability to random failures and external shocks. And we wouldn't be surprised if this loss of control and the increase in vulnerability would imply a loss or erosion of trust. Now we've started off with this uh, consideration, what if we had a strongly coupled world? But if you look at these features over here, we find them all in our current world. So we are living in a strongly connected world. And this world is fundamentally different from the loosely connected world we have grown up in, and which our intuition has been raised for. The intuition which is guiding us for our decision making, also in politics and business, it turns out that this intuition is not good enough anymore to advise us to take the right decisions. Now please fasten your seat belts because the next slide is thought provoking and uh, certainly controversial. I'll show it the first time and let's see what happens. I've been looking then for an example of a strongly coupled system. And one example that is strongly coupled is actually the, the atomic nuclei that we know in, in our physical matter. So what we, can we learn from this example? Well, first of all, we know that there are high energy at stake and that we can have fission and fusion. And in particular, we can have chain reactions. And here's a model of that. So you see a number of table tennis balls on mouse traps. And we will start off a small perturbation by dropping a black table tennis ball. And we'll see a chain reaction that finally affects the whole system. So we have learned recently that these kinds of chain reactions are very hard to control. And so the question is, have humans inadvertently built a global time bomb without even knowing? I cannot really answer this question. Well, I think we should spend some time thinking about this question. Of course, we can also ask ourselves, is this ex example at all relevant for our techno socioeconomic world? So can we learn something from it or not? And I leave it to you, actually. I continue now with a number of examples of cascading effects, and I don't want to imply with this that uh, these examples would be identical to the chain reactions in nuclear systems. Not at all. I'm fully aware that each of those systems is different. But also there are some similarities, and still we have to ask ourselves, what can we learn from that? Example number one, cascading effects and blackouts. So, for example, on the 4th of November 2006, a power line had to be turned off in order to allow for the transfer of a ship. Of course, that had been simulated before, but unfortunately, K-1 vulnerability had not been tested. So what happened was that there was a blackout that hit areas all over Europe. And you can see how difficult to predict actually this pattern of failure is, which is quite typical for complex systems, actually. Now, is this 
just restricted these kind of uh, cascading effects to technological systems like the electricity grid or are there other examples. And of course, what comes to our mind is financial systems. The current economic crisis started off with a subprime crisis in the US, so locally somehow. But that eventually hit mortgage companies, lenders, home builders, markets, the US economy, finally the world economy. And uh, we've been talking about uh, implications for currency exchange rates already this morning. So actually, Switzerland is suffering from this, from the hard currency. Uh, although it's a strong economy at the moment, it could really get into a, a depression state if that goes on like this. Anyway, what I want to say is that um, the problem started off substantial, but small enough actually to cope with. So in the beginning, there was a loss of one trillion US dollars. That's quite something, but uh, the world would have been able to cope with that to pay this bill. Unfortunately, we did not react quickly enough. And so that had an impact uh, on the world GDP, which was much higher, and the decline in the world stock market capitalization, which is even much higher. So again, again, you can see a cascading effect, which is now of a size which is hardly controllable, if at all. It's endangering now even the stability of the European Union, some people think. Hopefully we'll get this under control. Now, has this really been impossible to foresee? Well, in principle, I'm claiming that one could have predicted that a financial crisis would sooner or later happen because consumption in the US at some point in time, grew beyond the wages. So somehow that couldn't go on forever. It built up stress in the financial system, and we know from earthquakes that sooner or later there's a stress relief. And now we have a financial earthquake in some sense. Here's an illustration actually I think more than 400 banks have been dying in the meantime. I'm accelerating that a little bit. Uh, it looks a little bit like a flashlight uh, on a hot summer day. So it's, it's really shocking to see more than 300 banks have failed so far. And obviously that is a cascading effect, okay? But there are also cascading effects in the political landscape. Revolutions that are going on in Northern Africa, in certain Arabic countries. And the question is, um, is that a cascading effect? Well, it seems so. I mean, the transition from hierarchical governments to democracies in Europe before also was spreading in a cascading way. And we've seen a similar thing actually in Arabic countries. Now it seems that the world has been very much surprised by this. But why? I mean, it's well known actually that uh, the GDP per person is quite important for the political regime. And actually, if we take this number and also the fertility per woman, then there's a clear separating line which shows you now what are countries that are organized in a hierarchical way and what are the democratically organized countries. So as the GDP goes up, sooner or later there is a transition. So that was expected. It's not just a Twitter revolution. Twitter was just something like a catalyst, but it was not the driving force. And here's another problem that is worrying people since ages conflict in the Middle East. I can see over here 
violent events and also seems that there are cascading effects. Again, let me pronounce, I don't want to imply that it is the same as we've seen for nuclear chain reactions, but still it seems that events have an impact on future events. There are statistical laws behind that. These statistical laws may look different for different systems, of course, and we have to look at details of these underlying mechanisms. Also, natural disasters have cascading effects, and actually that often makes it a disaster. So many disasters uh, start locally and then become really dramatic through those cascading effects. So here's an overview actually for earthquakes. You don't have to read all this. Just shows you how complicated actually the dependencies in our human systems are. So earthquakes, of course, can cause tsunamis, can cause landslides and, and other kinds of natural disasters that go along with them. But also, we know in advance, actually, that the infrastructure would be destroyed. Uh, that makes it very difficult to, to perform rescue operations. Telecommunication breaks down. There are a number of issues, including health issues and so on and so on, humanitarian problems. But also implications, actually, for political systems, the credibility of political systems and so on. That is actually an analysis we have done a number of years ago based on past disasters, but uh, that very much applies to the Japanese earthquake we've seen recently. So what can we learn from this? In principle, we know what are the likely courses of events. And knowing this, there is a chance that we may be able to stop the propagation of the disaster stop the cascading effect at some point in time if we act quickly enough and we know in advance how to prepare for this. To minimize the impact of disaster, to reach disaster reduction. Well, now coming towards Switzerland, which uh, seems to stand outside like an island of all those global crises, uh, and it seems that what happened in Japan and also during the Arabic Spring is not at all related to Switzerland and we wouldn't have to worry about it over here. The same applies, of course, to many other European countries, but that's completely wrong. As we've seen, the Fukushima disaster has caused political changes in terms of our energy future, we have decided to turn away from nuclear power towards other energy sources. So events that have taken place thousands of kilometers away caused something like a political earthquake. Actually, it impacted uh, elections in Germany. Um, and now the, the question is, what are the implications for Switzerland and Europe? where to get the energy from. So one of the projects that have been planned for a long time is Desert Tech. It's planning to generate energy for all over Europe from solar energy that is being created, or that is the plan, in Northern Africa. And they want to spend a thousand billion euros on this project. But now we see that uh, this other event, which is thousands of kilometers away, the Arab Spring has somehow questions this whole project. So this project very much depends on political stability. Now, two completely different events actually now turn out to be related. And if we go a little bit more into the detail of the Arab Spring, we'll see that things are even more intricate. Because why did it all start in the Arabic countries? Because food prices actually reached a level people could not afford anymore to pay for. 
And that was one of the consequences that we started to uh, generate biofuels in order to compensate for global warming. And those biofuel production competed with food production. So it increased the price of food, which then that people in the financial market speculate on food prices, so they increase even further. And now we suddenly see that all things come together, natural disasters, social and political instability, uh, environmental change, financial markets, energy sector, and so on. So all of that which looked independent, actually it's closely coupled with each other if we analyze the situation more carefully. And also, gas supply for Europe very much depends on political stability. So we can see actually the socioeconomic factors have a very big impact on our life, at least as big I would claim as natural disasters and any other problems we have to cope with. And very unfortunately, we don't understand these problems well. Lizzie Bollinger, as president of the Columbia University formulated the issue as follows. The forces affecting societies around the world are powerful and novel. The spread of global market systems are reshaping our world, raising profound questions. These questions call for the kinds of analysis and understandings that academic institutions are uniquely capable of providing. Too many policy failures are fundamentally failures of knowledge. And we need to generate this knowledge. It's our task. Actually, sometimes it seems that this is the situation we are in regarding our knowledge on global techno-socioeconomic systems. A former president of the European Central Bank, Jean-Claude Trichet, formulated the issue as follows. When the crisis came, the serious limitations of existing economic and financial models immediately became apparent. We felt abandoned by conventional tools. He was then actually calling for closer collaboration be between economists and physicists and biologists and psychologists and so on and so on to get a better picture and actually um, a multi-perspective picture. When I heard Sandy Pentland talk at MIT last time, I was almost a little bit shocked because he had formulated the sentence that I had never said in that clarity at that time. He stated, as a universal truth almost, our financial transportation and health system are broken. They don't work anymore as they should. And he concluded that we need to develop a new decentralized adaptive approach. And in order to manage this kind of complexity, we require real-time data mining. Well, for sure, we need something like a knowledge accelerator. We have a huge knowledge gap on strongly coupled systems, on systemic risks on integrated risk management. We don't have good models of the economy that work in crisis. We really have incredible knowledge gaps and how could it all happen? Well, there's no time to discuss it, but for sure we have to close them as quickly as possible. So it required a large federated effort actually to fill this knowledge gap. And it requires scientists from many different fields to work together, from the engineering departments, from the natural science departments, and from the social science departments, in order to jointly address the challenges of humanity in the 21st century. It cannot be done by a single team or even by a single university. These are global challenges that need to be addressed jointly on a global scale. So we have been 
using this European flagship call to get the message out, to formulate a vision, to come up with a research program, and to build a unified community, a multidisciplinary community of scientists involving hundreds of people from more than 50 institutions, actually, from all different kinds of scientific fields. And we say, let's turn this mean on the moon vision around. Let's fly back from the moon to the Earth and pay attention to the problems of our world. And so how can we address those problems? What is the plan that we are proposing? Basically, bringing together computer power, information and communication technologies with complexity science and the social sciences. The social sciences are needed to ask the right questions. Complexity science is needed to come up with the right theoretical approach or to come up with theoretical approaches at all in order to understand what is going on. And ICT systems will give us the methods and tools to do that. So there are a number of uh, different outcomes that this project wants to reach. So first of all, a scientific outcome, which is the ability to understand our global techno-socioeconomic system. And on the other hand, a technological outcome, which is new ICT platforms for collective awareness and participation. And finally, a societal outcome, namely the ability to manage our global system towards a more resilient and sustainable society. And Future ICT will employ three different ways of gaining knowledge, three ways that are now becoming more and more available, which is a measurement by what we call a planetary nervous system, exploration by participatory platforms as kind of an experimental approach, and finally, large-scale simulation through this living Earth simulator that we are proposing. Of course, this large-scale simulation will need tons of data in order to calibrate models, validate them, or even to identify the right kind of models, and also to have the initial and boundary conditions, information about the networks that come into play, and so on and so on. So these data will come from this planetary nervous system, which you can imagine as a sensor network somehow, where sensors means anything that is uh, capable of measuring techno-socioeconomic activities. So the internet in itself would be something like a sensor in this context. Let me go into more detail. So we can do reality mining, real-time mining of data on a global scale actually because now so much more data are becoming available. Remote sensing, the internet, satellites, telecommunication, prediction markets, social networks, Web 2.0, Second Life, you name it. I mean, there are tons of data now, while lack of data was really a big problem in the social sciences in the past. So we can do data mining, we can do machine learning, and all these kind of things. Um, we can try also to extrapolate it a little bit into the future in, in order to do something like a social weather forecast or economic weather forecast in some sense. Certainly, possibility of this forecasting will be very limited, but anyway, even a, a little bit of knowledge and be it unsure can often improve the situation. I mean, every dollar that we are investing into weather forecasts generates a five-time higher benefit. And actually, if we manage to reduce those different problems in the world that I mentioned before, financial crisis, crime, 
war and all these kinds of problems. If we would reduce those problems only by 0.1%, this whole project would already pay off multiple times. Well, we think actually science can improve those, mitigate those problems by 10%, maybe 30%. We're not claiming we can get rid of all the problems of the world. But certainly science can make a contribution to improve the situation. Now how to understand better what is going on in the system? Well, as I said before, in those strongly coupled systems, the interactions are dominating what is happening. So we need to explore those interactions. We can do that by computer simulations, but we have to make certain assumptions. So why don't we explore real people's interactions in something like a virtual copy of the world? We've always said we, we cannot experiment with our future because we just have one future. But somehow we can change that. We can build multiple copies of the world as virtual worlds and then have one copy with this kind of financial architecture and that copy with another financial architecture and so on and so on. And that check out what happens as a result of the interactions of people in this virtual world. Of course, as I said, the interactions dominate, uh, dominate the outcome. We know that the people with good intentions, bad intentions, and all these kind of things. This is very difficult to model, but you know, in these virtual worlds, we can have all those people interact with each other and see whether the ideas we have of the world, a new law or regulation, whether that really works out well or whether people find tricks around. So ex let's explore it. Let's use these multiplayer online worlds that uh, hundreds of thousands of people are spending their spare time in every day. And finally, of course, simulation is another approach to gain additional knowledge uh, to do what if analysis with scenario techniques and try to find out what are the options that we have, what are likely implications feedback effects, cascading effects, and possible side effects. So for this, agent-based simulations can be helpful, multi-scale modeling, machine learning, and so on and so on. So I, I guess that is the area where this audience over here can make a lot of contributions to statistical interfer interference, and so on, nonlinear statistical modeling, all this, because emergent phenomena obviously result only when there are nonlinear interactions in the system. So nonlinear modeling is crucial in order to understand what is going on. So all these three different tools, measurement through the planetary nervous system, computer simulation, and exploration through these particular platforms will be put together to build Futurist Living Earth platform and help basically to give a better foundation for political decision making. Sometimes we call it actually a socio-economic political flight simulator to explore uh, the possible future. I mean we're using computers in all areas. If we build a new car a new plane, a new medical truck, supercomputers are being used in the very beginning to test for functionality, safety, efficiency, and all sorts of things. We're just not doing that enough in the area of economics and social and political questions. We didn't have the tools, actually. But let's be honest, we cannot build the decisions that need to be taken on our past experience because the world has changed. And on the other hand, complex systems often behave in a counterintuitive way. So intuition is also not necessarily a good guide. So we really need new methods and tools to advise us what is going on in our world and what are the options that we have and the implications of the possible decisions we may take. 
So this living Earth platform will contain a number of, as we call it, exploratories, an exploratory of society, an exploratory of economics, an exploratory of nature, an exploratory of technology, and we'll put them all together, integrate them in order to build this platform. And these exploratories will contain a number of other activities, such as the Crisis Observatory for Financial Instabilities, an observatory for conflict and war, means to measure the socioeconomic climate. Yes, in fact, what we are really lacking so far is our, uh, an ability to measure social capital, which is the basis actually of economic growth and social well-being, which is solidarity, cooperativeness, compliance, reputation, trust, attention, happiness, environmental care, and so on and so on. So these are social factors often resulting from social networks. So it's really difficult to quantify, but they're crucial and we need to care about that. Actually, saving our environment has started with our ability to measure environmental impact. If you want to save our society and make sure that we are using the substance of our social life while not damaging it, then it's very important that we will be, become able to measure the social footprint of human decisions and actions. So how do we get there? I think this is possible, but that is kind of the precondition for collective awareness of the problems we are facing and um, of responsible decision-making. So measurement is the issue, even though it's difficult. Then there will be crisis observatories for epidemic spreading and health risks, for observatories for transport and logistics, also to come up with contingency plans for evacuation scenarios and so on. There'll be crisis observatories for environmental change and all this. But not only we will have a focus on crisis, I mean, you know, we want to create some new technologies, new opportunities, no new business, uh, new businesses actually, new employment opportunities. And so there is this chance to come up with socially inspired ICT that is capable of collective awareness, of social adaptiveness, of social inspired bottom-up self-organization. Let me give a few examples. So social sensing is an example. I've been involved in uh, the elaboration of intervehicle communication systems, and these systems actually have a number of human-like features, such as perception, communication, joint cognition, collective sense-making somehow, decision-making, all these kind of things. And that is going to change our, not only transportation systems, but also our ICT systems of the future are going to change. Those systems, by the way, that's what I'm claiming will be social systems in some sense. Because these systems are composed of millions, yes, even billions of nonlinear interacting components, computers, mobile phones, sensors, and so on, and also users. But also those components will have more and more an own representation of the surrounding world and a subjective interpretation of what is going on and what will happen in the future. So there will be future expectations. All these are features that are characteristic of humans, actually. So that will create a new social system, an artificial social system somehow. But it also means that all the problems that we know of social systems may also occur in these future ICT systems, such as instability, coordination problems, cooperation problems, 
conflict, war, and all these kind of things. And if you have a look actually at uh, the curves of cybercrime, then they're really exploding. And since a few weeks, actually, America has uh, declared that cyber war is the reason for a war on a different country. So we can see we are already entering a situation where we have these social ICT systems. And if we don't understand how social systems work well, we won't construct those systems in a way that is sustainable and resilient. In order to construct these systems of the future, we first have to understand how society works, what are the principles that make our society work well. I mean, certainly we can profit from this knowledge. Here's an example. So here we start off with a simulation of the current traffic situation. You can see these annoying traffic jams, all right? Stop and go waves. And the question is how to get rid of this. Well, in order to analyze this situation a little bit better, we'll use a trick. So we'll turn this car into a helicopter. Uh, I, I love this car because it really allows me to get over the congestion. And let's, let's see what's going on here. So here's an on-ramp. You can see that there are some cars dropping into the freeway but they cause small perturbations of the freeway flow, and that causes the stop and go waves. Now we're accelerating the visualization, but the inflow stays the same, and then we're going to turn on a traffic assistance system, which is doing nothing else than changing the interactions between cars a little bit. The ways of controlling these kind of systems is implementing the right kinds of interactions. So, as you can see, capacity goes up, um, traffic flows becomes more stable, and we get rid of the traffic jam. So it is possible by small changes to improve those systems, but we need to understand them. Here's another example, which is freeway traffic. So the question was, how can we come up with a better way of controlling freeway traffic? And at the moment, we have a, a top-down approach, so there is a computer center, very expensive, with long cables to all the traffic lights and so on, getting information about the local traffic situation and so on. And then an optimization procedure is run and what the computer figures out to be optimal, that is being imposed on the traffic system. But it turns out actually not to be optimal because it cannot do the optimization strictly in real time. It has to make assumptions and simplifications. And so we said, OK, what if we had a completely different approach and had the traffic flows control the traffic lights? A decentralized, interactive, adaptive approach. And actually, it turns out to work beautiful. It was inspired, by the way, by oscillatory flows of pedestrians that are self-organized, and we transfer this pressure principle behind those oscillatory flows in order to generate these beautiful green waves, which are very efficient, actually. So that is actually a good example how scarce resources, in this case space and time, can be made better use of. It works beautifully even under very complicated situations like this terrible traffic network that we find over here in Dresden, which is cut through by many tram and bus lines, which makes it really difficult to have green waves and prioritize public transport at the same time. Actually, it was not possible at all in the past. So basically, the traffic authorities have given up on this area and they said, OK, you can have it. Try what you can do. And uh, so we came up uh, with an new approach, which is completely decentralized and bottom-up. I can see it's beneficial for everybody, for public transport, for individualized traffic, for pedestrians and cyclists, and also for the environment, by the way. Travel times go down. They also become more predictable. 
Although the traffic lights themselves, by the way, that's just interesting, they become much less predictable. Actually, to some extent, unpredictable. But the traffic performance becomes much more predictable. So there is really a paradigm shift in the way of doing these kinds of things. Here's another example. I will skip a little bit uh, through these slides. The challenge of the Hajj, where in the past hundreds of people died in crowd disasters, very unfortunately, and repeatedly. And uh, we actually learned what the problem was through a recording that happened to be done in an area where disaster happened in the year of 2006. And actually, that, that changed completely our way of understanding crowd disasters. Before, it was basically assumed that it's just the density. With, if the density is too high, then that creates a crushing situation, and people would die. But the situation is more complicated. Very surprisingly, there are transitions to other modes of um, movements in the crowd. So in the beginning, there is a smooth flow, but then there is a sudden transition to stop and go flow. And that can actually be considered to be a warning sign in advance of possible crowd disasters. But then eventually, there is a second transition to crowd turbulence. That is a situation where everybody is squeezed in between other people, and it's not possible anymore to control your own motion. Forces in the crowd adding, are added up. So basically, you're pushed around in an unpredictable way. It's almost like in an earthquake, and actually. And that is actually the reason why people fall, because it's hard to anticipate this motion. So eventually, they're losing a balance. And once people start to fall, then a cascading effect sets in. So that had to be changed. And a $1 billion investment has been made to counteract that situation. A new Jamarat bridge has been built that separates, actually, flows of people. But in order to work well, the whole Hajj had to be reorganized after more than 1,400 years. So we can see here that eventually a unidirectional flow organization has been implemented. And that managed to change the situation from this one, where it was even hard for emergency vehicles to get ahead, to this situation where it took that much less time to get to the Jamarat Bridge and back, so the density was reduced, it was much better flow, much higher safety, and uh, pilgrims liked this new organization. I'm finishing up with one example from computer systems. And you know that classically we have this client-server approach, but also there is another decentralized approach, uh, which BitTorrent is making use of, where you don't distinguish between client and server. This is a very interesting uh, example, because classical systems lose performance when there are more and more users like typical road, OK? And the more drivers, then the performance goes down. These systems actually gain performance the more people are participating. And an application example for this is actually Skype. Now, the problem of those peer-to-peer -peer systems is everybody needs to make a contribution, has to provide storage capacity, bandwidth, and contents actually. Otherwise, it's not working. So this is a typical public goods problem, as we know it from overfishing, from environmental destruction, exploitation, from social benefit systems, and so on and so on. So how can we address these kinds of problems? How can we avoid tragedies of the commons to happen? And in order to understand that, scientists are studying public goods games or a special variant of it, which is the prisoner's dilemma. And that is a scientific formulation of a situation where there is a risk to be cooperative, because you could be exploited. And there is a temptation 
not to cooperate. We say defect or cheat or whatever. So there's a temptation to defect because you can make a bigger benefit. And as a result of that, the expected outcome is that nobody would cooperate. We know this problem from public transport or people paying their tickets. We, also, Greece maybe is an uh, example for that situation. So it's very crucial actually to find out what are mechanisms that allow cooperation to flourish, because that's one of the basis, pil uh, basic pillars of society. And game theory has identified such kind of approaches. So um, repeated interactions, reputation systems, but also competitive mobility can actually increase cooperation. And here is an example where we start off with 50% cooperators in blue and 50% of uh, defectors in red. And you can see that after a very short time, we have a majority of blue, that means a majority of cooperators, which happens through a co-evolution of uh, behavior and spatial organization. Here it turns out neighborhood interactions are very positive to stabilize cooperation. Now, but what happens is basically we connect people in this game more and more with other people. As we do that in our information and communication systems today, we just connect them more and more without thinking about it. It turns out that as this goes on, cooperation breaks down and we end up with a situation where we have a tragedy of the commons. So in order to avoid such a situation to happen, a destabilization of the system through more and more connectivity, we need to understand the system and avoid these kind of mistakes. It may have happened already in the financial system which became a global village somehow over the years. And so that is exactly the kind of situation that is simulated over here. And of course, it's an oversimplified way, but it shows you that as we go on connecting the system components, the system behavior is changing dramatically. And with this, is, I am concluding. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm very much interested in your questions. So and so far, as there is maybe not so much time over here, I'm planning to be with you at the social event tomorrow evening and also in the break, so don't hesitate to talk to me. There's a microphone. It can you can. Good morning. Thank you for the talk. The question is: You are proposing complexity theory as an overarching framework for analyzing these complex systems. Are there any uh, alternative theories that you have come across in your development of future ICT? And where do you put graph theory and percolation theory and all other um, frameworks that are out there? Well, graph theory and percolation theory, I think, could be put into kind of the, the realm of complexity theory, I guess. Um, I would have a completely non-exclusive approach, actually. I think given the big problems we need to address, we need to make use of all the methods that are available and that are be becoming available. We should not exclude any method, actually. We should con connect the best knowledge we have. Yeah. There was another question. So. Thank you very much for the very brainstorming uh, presentation. We, and um, I was interested in uh, uh, another problem that is connected uh, to um, all the issue we've been talking about is the overwhelming of information that uh, the end user is subjected to. So you presented a very nice user architecture, system architecture, a very nice platform. The bottleneck could be the filter, the filter with the end user. So from a senior processing point of view, for us, filtering has never been an easy task. 
It's never been automated for any case study. The platform can be successful uh, only if we target it to the proper users, I guess. All right, in, in fact, um, the situation with information is going to develop in a way that uh, does not even allow us to store all the information we are generating and uh, to, to get it back from the databases uh, because there will be huge masses of information. So you're completely right, finding the useful bits of information will be the challenge. And there's also kind of side effects uh, in our society regarding a situation where we are overwhelmed with information, which is kind of a situation characterized by a lack of attention. And this kind of situation often ends up with herding behaviors, collective behaviors that can be harmful by themselves. Just think of bubbles at the stock market. If they're too big, they can be very problematic for the whole financial system. So our approach is actually um, a reputation and recommender system that we would like to create, and not actually a fully automated one, just based on computers, but also using human knowledge. Interface. And also what seems to be very important is that as compared to most recommender systems today, we should have a, a multifactorial approach, a multi-perspective approach. Um, and people could have different perspectives, different personalized filters, and we should come up with something like an information ecosystem where everybody can up, come up with filters for recommender systems. There would be a competition according to which filters work better or less, which ones are people like more or less. And it's very important, I think, that we have this kind of competitive and um, also complementary filtering approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I think we have to skip the further discussion uh, to the breaks and to the, to the dinner tomorrow afternoon. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Helden, for this very interesting talk. And be, on behalf of us all, on behalf of us all, we have a present for you, which is a very traditional type of Swiss presence, which I know that you will appreciate greatly, since you live in Switzerland. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can make a, a bidding for us. <laughs> No, no, actually, there, I, I have one small burning question here before the coffee break, uh, and that concerns the back coupling of the information this, a system like this would facilitate to society. H have you thought about the, uh, the, like the ethical uh, implica implications on, 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 on that, actually? Yes, absolutely. That, that is something we're spending quite a lot of thinking on. There is a focus group on ethical issues. Uh, will be a research area actually within this project and addressing these issues. Uh, in particular, privacy issues, how to do privacy respecting data mining and these kind of things is a concern that we have. So we want to promote this. And also, of course, the impact of these kinds of powerful systems on society. But it's important for us that that will be a system that can be used by everybody, so it can be benefit everybody and not just a few people. It should be fully transparent. Um, that is very important because that's the basis also of control of the system and how to use it. Um, if you're interested, we are going to come up with uh, position papers on this. Um, ethical experts are, are working on exactly these questions. And I'd like to invite you actually also to send me your thoughts after this talk by email. As far as I can, I'm happy to uh, respond to them one by one, okay? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, wait, hang on, a small follow-up. But, but, but to me, there seems to be a potential danger in presenting a system like that. Now I'm just being uh, very uh, critical because there is a completely unknown uh, possibility for back coupling. 
with the system to society, which may trigger yet completely unsought developments in society. Okay, I, I, I think these kind of backcouplings are happening already without us even noticing. Um, we need to be aware that all the systems, including you know, search, algorithms, uh, recommender systems, and all that what we're using already is manipulating our behavior in one way or another. We don't know how that will change society. And we don't know it because it's completely intransparent. And what I was proposing today, that will sooner or later be done anyway. It can be done by a big company, certainly. Uh, Microsoft, for example, has a uh, simulating the, the world initiative. Um, and many of the other proposals that I've made will certainly become true sooner or later. But the question is, should that knowledge be in the hands of a few companies or should it be in the hands of the people to benefit everybody? And I think there are a number of issues that are really important uh, because they're in the public interest and in the individual interest. And that's why it should be in the hands of people and not just in the hands of some companies. We could enter a situation uh, where social data, um, social innovations and uh, social inspired information communication systems could be in the hands of a few companies. There could be monopolies as we have it in the area of food production these days. And I think that is a situation we don't want to see. So really for that reason I think this kind of initiative should be done by the public, by an international public, and everybody should profit from this. We shouldn't leave it just to a few people.